God sanctifies us through the power of his spirit. As we journey in this life, we are hopefully on a journey towards spiritual maturity. And that is the process of sanctification. And, that, and sanctification simply means we are becoming more like Christ. Now, one of the ways that we participate in this process is to abstain or shun or avoid sin. Beloved, we know, you don't, none of us need to be told, but sometimes we need to be reminded that sin is a severe hindrance to the will of God in our lives. It prevents us from walking with God as we should. It keeps us from sharing his word with confidence and with surety and with authenticity. And it can keep us from reaching others with the truth of the message of the gospel that Jesus saves and sets free from sin. Sin is a trap. And it will catch hold of us and it will disrupt our efforts to serve Christ for as long as we remain caught. But praise God that our Lord and Savior is in the business of setting people free from the trap of sin, forgiving them, and sending them on to spiritual maturity and eternal life. Look with me at our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to begin by looking at verse 3 and then verse 7. And it says there, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That's one form of sin. And verse 7 says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Lord, we are celebrating freedom, but most of all, we are celebrating freedom from sin that can be found only through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we come in his name, Lord. And we thank you <clears throat> that we're able to gather here today. Th we thank you, Lord, for your presence that is in each one of us and among us when we gather. Lord, we thank you for your word and the wisdom it contains. And we pray, Lord, that this wisdom would be hidden in our hearts, applied to our lives so that we might not sin against you. Lord, I thank you for the privilege I have to preach your word. And I ask, Lord, that you would add your blessing to the reading of your word and the remainder of this service. Help us, Lord, to understand the importance of celebrating your sacrifice, as we will do in just a few moments. Help us to understand the importance of sharing the message of the gospel with those around us so that they might find the freedom that can only be found in you. Lord, we thank you that we still live in a country where we're free to assemble, to worship, and to share our faith. And we pray, Father, that you would preserve these freedoms for us and our children and our children's children until such time as you return and establish your kingdom here on the earth. Lord, we thank you for these things. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So the will of God for our sanctification is that we abstain from sin. It says in verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification in honor, not in the lust of, cons uh, excuse me, That's a word I don't know how to pronounce. Let me try. I thought that said conscience, but my dyslexia is giving me fits here. Not in the lust of con capitions. Wow, I have, that one slipped past me. So you you have to forgive me about the, on, on that one. Maybe somebody with a different translation help us out. Other than King James, does someone have that word? On verse 5, lustful passions. Okay, so that's a word for passions. Forgive me. I, I, needed, to, I needed that clarification, I'm sure, as much of, as many of you did. It says, so not, as, not even as the Gentiles which know not God. In other words, 
despite that, that large word that snuck up on me. Don't be like those who do not know God. We as Christians are called to be set apart. We are called to holiness. We are called to abstain from sin. We are called to be different and in a good way and in a godly way. When we, when we look around us and, and we see people who don't know Christ, we're not, we're not to judge them. We're to expect them to live a life that does not include Christ. But if we claim to belong to Christ, our life includes him and everything he is. And for us, that means the Holy Spirit dwells in us and everything he teaches, which means we spend time in the word of God so that we will know what standard he expects of us. And ultimately, the standard is perfection. Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, as, even as my Father is perfect. And, he's, and you're probably thinking right about now, now hold on, preacher. Nobody's perfect. And you're right. But remember, God gives us the power of his Holy Spirit to live and do the best we can. And for God, that's good enough. What, what, what do I always say? Lord, help me to serve you as best I know how and teach me to serve you better. That, that's, a, I, I feel like, a, a, a great philosophy. Because how can I do anything else? The goal is to learn to serve him better, to serve him the, the best that I can, to live a life that's set apart and sanctified and holy unto the Lord. That's what we are called to do as Christians. And we can't do that if we allow sin to control all or any part of our life. Now, does that mean that we're never going to fall short? Absolutely not. Because we can't be perfect. Sin is going to catch hold of us from time to time in this life. Hopefully, it's... it's Smaller and smaller sin, and, it's, and the sins are fewer and far between as, matu as we mature in Christ. But they're that sin is going to catch hold of us. So how can we aspire to perfection when we know we are hopelessly imperfect? Well, Christ was perfect for us. And because he was perfect for us, and because he sacrificed himself in our place, and because he rose again on the third day, then we can become partakers of the perfection of God. And so he will one day, when we stand in his presence, bestow his righteousness upon us in such a manner that when he sees us, he sees only the sacrifice of our Savior and the perfection of Christ paying the penalty for our sins, and nothing else. For the followers of God, there, there is no judgment with regard to guilt or innocence with respect to sin because we are perfected in Christ. Now, beloved, we as the children of God will face judgment. And we will be judged according to the things that we did that brought glory to God or the things that we avoided doing that would have brought glory to God. Sin doesn't come into the, into the equation except in this sense, how it holds us back from doing those things which are pleasing to God. So you see, we won't even be judged for the hindrance because sin does not come into the equation for the children of Christ with regard to eternal life. We have it. We stand before God perfected in Christ. We have eternal life and nothing can take that from us. We are in the hand of God and we belong to him. 
However, this life is an opportunity to serve God, to, to build up a reward, to be faithful, and, and to be a good steward of the resources that God has given us, ourselves, our time, and those things and those blessings that God gives us so that we might serve him, we will be judged according to those things. And so what, what we're in, beloved, is a, a battle or a conflict with, uh, with ourselves and with sin and with the world around us. And the goal is to overcome the sin within ourselves, the sin around us in the world and those things that, that hold us back from serving God because we want to hear when we stand before him, well done, good and faithful servant. We want to stand before God and when we face the judgment as Christians, be judged according to those things which we did that brought glory to God, which were pleasing to him so that we will have no shame, we'll have no sorrow. Our We'll have no difficulties with technology. <laughs> we'll, we'll simply be sure that our service to him was worthy. That we did what we were called to do. So the, what that means for us is that we have to follow the example of godly men and women in the, it, that, whose lives and actions are recorded in, in Scripture who were faithful, who lived worthy and holy lives. Those, when you think of someone who ran from sin, you can't help but think of Joseph. As he ran from Potiphar's wife as she tr attempted to entice him and seduce him into sin. He fled, he, even though she was tr physically holding him back, he left, he left his garment behind. She had a hold of his coat, and he, and he left it. And he paid the price. He paid the price. But God worked it together for his good. And sometimes, doing what's right is costly, but God works it together for our good. You think about Daniel. He, he simply served the Lord. I'll, Daniel prayed when it was forbidden, and he ended up in a lion's den. But God worked it together for his good. He paid a price for doing what was right. Now, Peter, he's, a, he's an interesting character. Study, study Peter, the disciple of Christ, the apostle, and uh, you'll see someone that we can all identify with. You can see someone who had a, a lot of anxiety, a lot of, of turmoil. He, he was uh, an emotional guy. He was a, uh, someone who was uh, fiery, if you will. You know, he, he, you know, he even said to the Lord, if, you know, if everyone leaves you, I will never forsake you. You know, not me, Lord. You can just, you know, see, how, you know, in, the, in that statement, how, how uh, outspoken he was. And we know that he denied Christ three times. He fell short. And Jesus even told him afterwards that Satan is going to sift you like wheat. But afterwards, when you return, feed my sheep. He told him three times, feed my sheep. He said, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter returned. He was held back by sin. He was caught by that trap, but he returned to the freedom found in Christ. And you know the rest of the story. Served the Lord with boldness and gladness and laid his life down as a martyr for the faith. Doing what's right can be costly, but God works it together for our good. Of course, you know the story of Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle. 
He went from a persecutor of the, of the church to a prophet of God, in the, and prophet in the sense that he proclaimed the word of the Lord. He was what we might call one of the elite in Jewish society. Well thought of, he was a Pharisee, he was uh, well known, well liked, fervent, zealous uh, in his uh, function in, in society, and he gave it all up. And he became what he sought to destroy. And he followed Christ to his death as well. He did what was right. It cost him a lot, but God worked it together for good. And so our fir the first thing we must understand in order to participate in the process of becoming more like Christ, being sanctified in him, is to flee from sin. Now look at verses 9 and 10. It says there, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. So run from sin and live in love. And there's really no need for me to say more than what Scripture says because we as Christians, young and old and in between, know that we are called to love God and to love others. And Christ made this clear that those two commandments fulfill all the law and the prophets. Everything that God has revealed to us with regard to love are fulfilled in doing those two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So you have no need, as, as did these Christians of old, that I say more to you than that, but I do echo what we read here in Scripture, that you love God more and you love your neighbor more. Let that be your goal as you live in love. Now verses 10 and 12. We're called to walk in holiness, 10 through 12. And indeed, you do it toward all the, excuse me, let's look at 11. And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may lack of nothing. Walking in holiness to God means that we live quiet and peaceful lives. The scripture says, as far as it is within your ability, be at peace with all. Why? Because unnecessary conflict is ungodly and anything ungodly falls into the category of sin and anything sinful will hinder us from living according to the will of God in our life, which prevents us from growing spiritually and hinders the process of sanctification, which we know is part of what God has called us to. So being at peace with people is, is a very important of walking in holiness. It, it says there in our text, mind your own business. Well, why would, why would that be important in our walk with God? Uh, that really doesn't need any explanation. It leads to conflict, it, and that leads to a, a hindrance, and it prevents us from doing what God has called us to do, to grow in Christ. And then it says something very interesting, which, which I, I really appreciate. Work with your own hands. Work with your own hands. God put Adam in, and Eve in the garden to do what? To work. God made us 
for work. Even, us, even those re retired among us, God has made them also for work. Yeah, I heard someone say the retired work more. More than some, that's for sure. God didn't make us for leisure, though he did make us for rest. Six days he worked, and the seventh he sanctified, because on the seventh he rested. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. God made us for work. He made us for rest. But there's a balance and the balance is in favor of work. And the work that we do, we sh regardless of what it is, we should do as unto the Lord. Now, we may or may not be someone who physically works with our hands. But I think what's implied there is that the fruit of your labor, whatever it is, should be something that you can be proud of, something that is pleasing to God, and something that ultimately gives you the resources to dedicate a portion of to further the work of God's kingdom. Yeah, I had a, a couple in my church uh, several years ago in, in, a, in another church, not this one, and they were baby Christians growing in their faith. And they, they came to me one, one Sunday and they said, Brother, we are under conviction. And, and I said, okay. I, was, I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what, what conviction they were under. And they said, we've been growing in our faith and we believe that God wants us to sell our business. I didn't even know they owned a business because they both had jobs. That, and they were working for other folks. And I said, well, what business is that? And they said, well, we really believe that God wants us to sell our liquor store. And I said, you know what? I think you're hearing from God. It, now, that's not the end of the story. It, it, was, it, it was something that was very uh, lucrative. And they had to make sacrifices they had to scale down the uh, level of luxuries that they enjoyed. They ended up selling their large home and buying a smaller one. They ended up giving up some of the uh, toys that they had accumulated over the years, boats and things of that nature. But man, what a testimony. They gave those things up, but I believe God was go is going to give them more in return. Doing right was costly for them, but they were able to live according to the convictions the Holy Spirit had play, placed on their heart. And ultimately, I believe they received a greater blessing because when they did what, what God had called them to do, their faith grew exponentially compared to what they had, the rate at which they had been growing before. So... They were walking in holiness, working with their hands so that they might be proud of what they were doing. And then finally, we can't go into uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 without looking at the hope that is proclaimed in the second half of the chapter. Look with me at verse 13 and following. It says, But I would not have you uninformed, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is, that are those who are, have died, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope, because we have a sure and certain hope, which is Christ Jesus. And it says there in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 
So run from sin, live in love, walk in holiness, and hold on to hope. All right. Deacons, if you would come forward at this time, we will observe the Lord's Supper.